Yes. A latest adieu to her tea table. Farewell the tea board with its body equipage of cups and saucers, cream bucket, sugar tongs. The pretty tea chest, also lately stored with hyson, congo, and the best double pine. Hold oh, many a joyous moment have I sat by you, hearing the girls tattle, the old maids talk scandal, and the Bruce Coxcomb laugh at maybe nothing. No more shall I dish out the once love before, though now detestable, because I'm taught and I believe it true, it will fasten slavish chains upon my country. And liberties, the goddess I would choose to reign triumphant in America. January 20th, 1774, the editor of the Virginia Gazette, Clement Pianton, published this poem in the Virginia Gazette, which is a Williamsburg newspaper. This was published less than one month after the incident at Griffin's Wharf in Boston that we would later know as the Boston Tea Party. So how did the kind ladies such as myself, <laughs> along with the lady who wrote this poem, their husbands and other colonists, come to swear off tea, their beloved drink, that at this point, Benjamin Franklin is quoted as saying, at least a million Americans drink twice a day. Before we get to the answer to that question, let's give a little bit of background about tea. Where is it coming from? How and when did the Americans first fall in love with this elixir that by 1773 becomes stuff we're going to swear on? Tea consumed in Britain and in America were being grown and harvested in various regions of China. So right away, um, the spelling any um, idea you have in your mind that came from other parts of the world. It's all from China at this point in our in our history. Some tea historians believe that uh, tea was first deep here in America as early as 1647 in Manhattan by Dutch colonists. If that's true, we're enjoying tea here in America before the English first are introduced to it in some London coffee house in 1658. We're drinking tea for the It was the Dutch who first brought tea uh, west from China, not the British. Uh, some of you uh, who are familiar with tea may also know that Catherine Bernanza of Portugal, who was the wife of King Charles of England, she is the one who first introduced it to England. Portugal um, and tea uh, have a mutual story together. And tea was very much a part of their um, Portuguese culture. So, of course, she's going to bring it with her when she married the three colors together. By the way, I should mention that the word tea is not found anywhere in writing before the 17th century. It's not in Shakespeare, it's not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Relatively quickly, tea becomes a popular beverage for us here in the colonies. By the mid 1700s, we Americans are consuming almost 2 million pounds of tea annually. That's a lot of tea. It started with just the upper classes when tea was a little bit more expensive, but as it got more affordable, the middle classes could enjoy it, and so too could the lower classes, albeit maybe not quite as nicely. Uh, typically, if you're quite poor, you would be using tea leaves that are already steeped and would be reusing them. For those of you who drink tea like me, that's not very good, but they were in point. During the 18th century, um, tea is becoming a little um, less expensive, and it becomes the drink of respectable British and colonial households everywhere. We adopted tea ceremony, and Rick will tell you I had a tea ceremony almost every day at home. I don't just heat up water and stick it in a tea bag. And, you know, 
it is a ripple. Uh, tea becomes a family event at first. It's quiet and it's pleasant. It's full of etiquette and rules that prepare our youngest members of our family um, to be out in society. As I mentioned, when it becomes more affordable, um, tea is something that can be enjoyed by everyone. You can enjoy uh, wealthy families, middle class families, poor families. Um, and we are really, by the time the British are drinking tea, we're trying to emulate the English aristocracy and even the royal family back. The tea equipage that I was reading um, the poem about um, in the beginning became very popular as well. Of course, the more we drink tea, the more we need things to enjoy tea and then they should say, yeah, I've got things all over our house to enjoy tea. <laughs> you know what Charles is in there. <laughs> um, we have uh, teapots, cups and saucers, sugar pump, uh, cream pitchers, et cetera. By the 1770s, this tea equipment could be found in around half of all the probated estates of the streets in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He is consumed daily, two or three times a day, alone, with family, with friends. It becomes part of our daily American lifestyle, including here in the colony of Virginia. So when it comes to be taxed, we are not happy and trouble for our food. That was a growing on <laughs> In the programs of my life, we're going on 40 years together, and I think we might have done four programs together in 40 years. So it's kind of fun to get to this. Appreciate it for all of you. I think many of you know what I'm about to say. We learned this in school, maybe fourth grade, maybe sixth grade, maybe 11th grade, maybe college, maybe not as we need. The French and Indian War that we managed to start out of the frontier of Pennsylvanians and Virginians, concerned about our ability to move west, started a war in 1754 that will become uh, the thing that will cause the American Revolution. Who starts that war? Sort of like that could be a little 22 year old from Fairfax County. I won't go into it, but if you want to read the story of for necessity, you'll get the basics of it, of how this happens, how the war begins, how vast numbers of troops must be sent. And as they are sent, um, the expense just keeps going. Isabella putting the Lord Lab, um, he was sent to be the new commander in chief of British forces in North America that quickly discovered that getting the colonists to work together to both organize and finance this effort against the French who are extending southwest out of Quebec, right into where we want to extend due west into the same place, the Ohio Valley. That to fight them to get the colonists to actually coordinate for that is like burning ass. It does not please him. And he starts noticing how just about everything in the colonies work. When he goes home, he doesn't have much food to say about the Americans. Yes, we're the day for 1757 during this war in order to get our own militia out of the the general said that has a bunch of speaking in the United Kingdom. So, you know, the deal of that war, the French are defeated, uh, a huge expense to the Royal Navy Army, and a huge expense for the columns, the way they call out their militias. Um, so, at the end of that war, there are expectations. The American expectation, of course, is without those French here, they do not need a god. Off they go. And so our thing will be to hope we could explode into the West. Unfortunately, Native Americans out there are not going to be particularly pleased with that notion. So let's step back for just a second. If you go to England, our problem is that this is a little village in England in Derbyshire in the Peak District. This is three people's life. Well, would have gone. If you've ever heard of him, he's the most famous diarist of the American Revolution. 
So we decided we would get lost in the Pittsburgh, find email, find where you live, this is where. And I just use it as an example. Yes, it's going to happen to taxes in England. We ran up this huge price tag to fight a war that began in America, became a world war against France. The Seven Years War, as they call it, one of the most expensive wars known to that time. You've got to increase taxes to pay the bill. And taxes are generally on land or whatever else you can get. So we have a problem here. But the average, average English taxpayer, Nicholas Maxwell of Gap, we're talking a killer tax. And what do people do when they're mad at taxes? They get in touch with their legislator. Their MPs, members of parliament, the member of the House of Lords, more typically the member of the House of Commons, and they get credibly about it. That's what the members of the We are, after all, impeachment, we're in the habit, we know it's how this works. So think about this. They've got to have tax relief. That's who started this war. Well, we did. Virginians did, to be precise. And did they pay their fair share? Honestly, who knows? All we know is cost a lot, we're getting hit with the bill, and the Americans are going to have to pay. Now, if you go to any one of the assemblies in any of the 13 colonies, what are they dealing with? The fact that they have this huge bill for their militias that they had to send all over the place to defeat the French. And therefore, what are all of those general assemblies going to do, whether it's the general court in Massachusetts or the House of Burgess in Virginia, they're going to raise taxes. You see a problem here. The Americans are raising their own taxes. The British are about to find another way that they can raise revenue other than taxing their own people. And we got to be it. So off we go. Let's make sure this is right side up. I figured if I bought one of these little things, I could make it work perfectly. So this is the $12 special, one quarter of today's staples. The only thing is that you never know. Which arrows I'm supposed to push? So, those. So, the Americans are about to raise their taxes. Parliament is about to raise their taxes. And at the very least, we have the West as sort of safety valve to take all of these extra Americans that have been coming to the colonies and move them out to the Ohio Valley. Well, just then, we have the audience running out on the frontier. Native American uprising and Indian Navies, and it is going to be a bloody mess for two years, 1763 or five. The crown hears about this and figures the easiest thing to do is let's keep the Americans out of there, at least for a while. Hence, the proclamation of 1763, like the beginning of the rebellion, you cannot go over the Alleghenies. Means you can go to West Virginia as of today, but not Western Virginia. Right? You can't go to the Ohio Valley. You can go to Mount Pennsylvania, but you can't go in the Ohio Valley to Pennsylvania. So we've got a kind of a problem here. The Americans have suddenly been told that they can't do the one thing that they really want to do. Yeah. Yeah. We have tigers and lions on the roof of St. James Church. Man, they are not happy. <laughs> That's fine. The standards. Well, I'm not going to go to every single act that gets passed, but you know about well, this one. We've had programs on it, and in essence, what we're going to do is tax the American middle class by requiring a stamp. It is actually a red and white stamp of sedum that they be glued to all kinds of paper by a newspaper, a gas, by a book, paper cards, any legal document, the lawyer has to give it. Any transactions or bills of lading that a merchant has to deal with, you're going to have to pay this tax. Two problems. Yes, who's going to have to pay? Who uses paper? The middle and upper class. Who's got the wherewithal and the ability to fight this? The middle class. And we have one other problem as well. No one asks. Look. That's not true. They did too. They gave us like three months to get our assemblies together and get all 13 of them to agree on a tax. Getting the Americans to agree anything? 
That's not trying to get Republicans and Democrats to agree on anything. Ain't gonna happen. So what happened? No, nothing to do with that. But since the Americans did nothing, we have a secret. We have not been consented, and this is something altogether new. Americans pay taxes to their own assemblies. Americans pay duties as members of the British Empire on certain items that are imported to America, and they're told that all items they import to America must go to major ports in the UK first, be unloaded, reloaded. That's just standard procedure, one of those little customs things that countries have. We're used to that. Any of those kind of things are considered to be uh, purely mercantile. They're not a tax by American revenue. This, the stamp act, is a tax. And Americans go wild. You would hear of a year ago, we heard an excellent program on some of the first great protests in the stamp act right across the river in Maryland's biggest town, the entire rest of Maryland, the very town. Uh, and believe me, this happens in every single call. <laughs> so, we know that the Americans, using their representatives uh, to gain people who would have had some one delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton does to Congress. She still would have had represents D.C., but she doesn't have a vote. But we were that. We had people like Ben Franklin, others. Every colonial assembly had that. And they would go and they would, you know, people would grab them by the hotel and try to chuck sense into them about having a vote. One party in Parliament, the Green Party, was quite good at seeing American people. They don't want to sit more than a while back in any conservative party, mostly from rural areas, just like today in America. They don't understand it at all. All they know is that they agree about the taxes they want the Americans to pay. Nonetheless, Parliament realizes with a massive demonstration of America, the violence against tax sellers, such that almost everyone in America and almost every city who's on their commission means that we end up with the set back in with the conservatives, the Tories, if you will, to demand that a declaratory act be passed, and it is, and it clearly says we have the right to legislate for the American colonies through Parliament in all cases whatsoever. You're American, what's that? Who knows? Legislate? Did you say nothing about taxes? Maybe we got our will here. <laughs> no, you know. You probably remember this. The Declaratory Act is passed a couple years later. We had a whole new revenue package from Parliament. We are now going to taxes that will be put on items sent to America. And they're going to be put on in England or Scotland or Ireland before they're set up. And these students will be on key banks paper. It just to add our paint. Americans were really into paint by the 1760s. Like the colors, fine green, turquoise. I don't know how to think 1973. Most of them have to be called in the early 1760s, so you know, 1767. Paint is a big lead. What do you need that for? Well, pewter among other things. Glass. We don't have much glass in it, actually. I think they closed that big in Jamestown about 16. Now, you can see blood down the island where you build that little glass wall and say, you go to Leesburg, you're dead in Jamestown. We didn't do that much. Came from England. And T, there's where you're going to say three pence per pound of tea. That's a pence, keep in mind. 12 pence to a shilling, 20 shillings to a pound, 240 pence to a pound. So you're talking three, do the math. That's one eighth of the first small amount that would be put on a pound of tea. Did they expect Americans? To complain against it was, of course, no, they did not. So, I'm going to address to talk about how Americans respond to this. You know, if you didn't think this was very loud, there's a really special reason why. <laughs> But 
But first of all, I, mean, yeah. I told him he didn't need it. <laughs> Thanks for coming to me. How dare you? How dare you? Parliament didn't think it was a big deal. The East India Company, which was the company bringing the tea to us, no big deal. It's three pence per pound of tea. Why would we call this on? That's not enough for us to give up our tea, is it? Yeah, it is, because as Rich said, it's taxation without representation. That's what it all comes down to. Three pence isn't a whole lot. By the street heads more than we were asked about. So we're upset. What are we going to do about it? We boycott and we boycott and we boycott. Young ladies in Boston signed a pledge to deny ourselves the drinking of foreign tea in hopes to frustrate a plan which tends to deprive a whole community of all that is valuable in life. I love the way they make tea. These Boston ladies were not alone in their opposition. Seaports in Salem, Newport, Norwich, New York City, and Philadelphia in the north, and then coming down to the south, Annapolis, Williamsburg, Wilmington, Carlton, and Savannah in the south. Women and men continue to avoid their much loved tea from China that Britain had purchased and was going to send over to us through the East India Company. Uh, American merchant houses started to get in trouble because of that. Instead, we're sipping our own concoctions of tea. Ladies, we are making our own liberty teas. We are growing fruits in our orchards, we're growing herbs in our gardens, and we're making liberty teas. And some of us yet are smuggling teas, but we are not smuggling Chinese tea from China. We are smuggling tea from the Dutch. We're getting through them. And there are many Americans who do that, and that does start to hurt the people. But ladies, do unite with me. Let us start growing these fruits, these herbs. Let's make our liberty tea. Woe be it to any colonists drinking Chinese tea that had passed through the East India Company in London. So now I'll switch to this thing. So I haven't seen it works. See uh audio visual aid challenge to five that well, first things first. Laboratory tea, which was the most typical of the liberty teas, is stupid and bloodly disgusting. <laughs> and no matter how hard you said, oh, we should drink this, we should be patriots. Ah. And therefore, the habit was to find an alternative to liberty or laboratory tea. Now, the most obvious, Tracy's already pointed out. And that is, you have to get smuggled tea. Now, it is an old English custom. You are a watcher of PBS on Sunday nights. I think you've seen enough British melodramas uh, through the BBC, et cetera, to know that it's what the British do. You know, they're supposed to get them in Cornwall or wherever. They're always smuggling tea. So did we. What do you think Chesapeake Bay is for? What do you think the Rocky Coast of New England is for? Or the coast of Connecticut, or even the sandy coast of Carolina, once you get into the Pamela Coast Sound. Come on, you can easily, easily do it. Some cities had an advantage, they had better smugglers. I know you're going to say, must be the only not. It was the people of Philadelphia South that had a better smuggling operation, and even as far up as New York City, those people were smuggling like crazy. Now, here's the problem. If you say, I'm not going to drink tea, because obviously I can't be drinking smuggled tea, illegal. I can't be drinking British East India Company tea, not politically correct. Um, could you drink smuggled tea and would anyone know? 
I mean, could you just say, I'm taking over this kind of thing? The law of this dash T. How does anyone know what this dash T is? It's the same darn T sold by the same darn people and then distributed to two different countries by their own British East India Company, or Dutch East India Company, etc. There's a little problem. You can cheat. And this is the second thing. Um, if I cheat, will anyone know? Wait a minute. If we get together and decide we're going to have this library or team, and all the other people do that, and then they go home, what are they going to do? Have real cheat that they're cheating with, right? Um, also, to make it worse, some cities have very uncooperative tea in major merchant houses for the biggest businesses in America at that point. This is Richard Clark, the only the biggest merchant house, I think a fellow by the name of John Hancock in Boston, Massachusetts. And as far as he's concerned, he will sell this stuff. No non imputation agreement will be signed. Remember this stuff. He's got to be a problem going forward. And I can tell you that if we can't get people to fully agree to do this, or if they're going to cheat on the side, or if they say, well, my neighbor cheats on the side, and only when we get together the very public things, we'll be drinking whatever we're tea. How do you think this non-invitation is going to work? Surprisingly, it works, but not well enough. There's a thing, not well enough. And I will tell you also that because of violence and protests, it will be decided to remove the Townsend duties. Wisely removing the duty on pink and paint and light and glass, but not tea. One of the smallest duties that is left out there as a symbol. Don't you dare tell us we can't do it. We had to have a glorious revolution in 1688 and then short of parliament and governments. And you're telling us we can't govern? Like the Georgians and Connecticut Yankees and King Arthur's court telling us we can't govern? How do we it? Oh, because of that, tea drinking returned to that by 1770, of course, and by 1772, even slightly more than that. So, did the gamble of the Parliament work or not? Take a couple of minutes to tell you about the British East India Tea Company. How many of you have heard of the East India Tea Company? It still exists today. I just found this out recently. It is not what it once was, um, but there's um, a, a married couple that has purchased the, the use of the name and they um, they export a lot of the similar goods that the East India Company did at one point. Other than that, it's quite a different company. The East India Tea Company will mention a few times um, this afternoon. It played a huge role in what we're discussing today. And it's old by this time, by the 1770s. Queen Elizabeth I granted it a charter in the year 1600. It was set up for worldwide trade, but also it could make allies. It could literally raise armies and go to war. It was able to do that. Britain expected a lot of the East India Company to accomplish things all around the world, and it did. It was quite successful for decades and decades and decades. By the early 1700s, the East India Company was paying custom duties that amounted to about a third of the custom revenue for the nation. It made money for the British government. It made money for its stockholders, conveniently, maybe. Many of its stockholders were members of Parliament. But as time went on, as with many successful companies, unfortunately, um, it also accumulated a record of greed and corruption, certainly by the time the 1760s were born. This also happened to correspond with um, a very bad uh, drought and famine in um, India, in parts of India that they were trading with. 
And the East India Company did nothing to help the thousands and thousands of people who were starving and dying there. Um, so it was soon looked upon with a lot of respect back in London. It stopped being in it to plummet. Obviously, the stockholders are not going to be happy with that. It's also um, continuing to purchase more and more tea from China. Remember, tea is, is popular in these decades. More and more people are drinking it, so more and more is being um, grown and harvested in China, purchased by East India Company, and shipped um, to their warehouses in London along the Thames River. Uh, they're trying to monopolize the trade. They're trying to drive up the prices. But unfortunately, the smuggling that Rich is uh, talking a bit more about um, is, is creating a problem for the company. So the East India Company ends up with a surplus of 17 million pounds of tea in storage in their warehouses, 17 million pounds of tea. It had frequently asked for loans when needed from the Bank of England, which had helped them out, but not yet. So Parliament faced the problem. The company is too big to fail. We have to do something to fail them up. They do ultimately do that, but it's at the expense of us American colonists. On top of that, Britain is starting um, to take a downturn in its economy. A lot of people are leaving for the colonies, including coming here to Virginia and North Carolina. A lot of our um, Scots and Scott Irish are coming around this time. So things are, are turning a bit sour back in, in the mother country. So, will you turn to when you need help? Oh, you turn to Parliament, but you can lay up a lot of parliamentarians, whatever you start with. That's pretty convenient. This leads us to the infamous. 1773 Tea Act, which will be done in the spring of 73. Part economic bailout of the too big to fail British East India Company, part revenue enhancer for the British government at the time of declining revenues due to the economic downturn at that point. What does the Tea Act do? To make it in simplest terms, the way tea is sold, it's auctioned by the British East India Company at their headquarters and at the docks. They have a whole network of places that large American merchant houses like the Clarks and the Hancocks in Boston, or their county west in Charlotte and Norfolk or Savannah would buy tea. And then the Americans, that's good business for the Americans, buy this tea, bring them home, and then they act as the wholesalers once they get to the American dock and your corner sort and then buy it from at Boston, in Boston, and Boston, or your board. Good. What they did is this. They are now going to let the British East India Company totally cut out the American middlemen, and they are going to allow them to hold auctions at the docks of selected American ports. And you can guess which ones, all the big ones, particularly Boston, and New York, and Philadelphia, and Charleston. But they won't be the only ones. So that means the tea is going to come in. And with this cutting up the middleman, what's going to happen to the price of tea? It'll run. They're going to keep the tea duty at three pence per pound. How much tea amount is? You know, when you typically go to a tea shop, bring on tea, you want to bring on two ounces, four ounces, and a pound of 16. That's a lot of tea. That's like 50, 60 dollars worth of tea today. Three pounds come out, that's happening. They'll swallow it, but you can do because the price of tea is plummeting because of our direct at the dock auctions in America. Who is going to be furious? The same American leaders that realized that this is a problem. Problem number one, you're going to cut out our middlemen. middlemen. Who are those middlemen? The most prominent of whom are activists in the Sons of Liberty. I mean, John Hancock in Boston, come on. And his counterparts in the major cities, you got to cut them out. You don't think they're going to be mad about it? Two, this means it is going to set a precedent of America swallowing the tax, we drink that tea. 
swallowing a tax which we had no input at all. Same problem as we had with Townsend movies, so sad. And number three, what's that money going to go to? Pay royal donors, pay royally appointed officials that Americans had no input into. Wait a minute. How would I? Well, let me take Massachusetts as an example. Massachusetts it was done by the General Court. That was their House of Representatives. And then approved by the members of the council, the governor's council, who were chosen by the General Court. And suddenly they're all caught up with the governor is totally independent. Judges are totally independent. No one has to rely on any democratic input or pay. The power of the first has been stripped. Wow. What a killer act. So, news that arrives in America in the fall. And in the news of that, the question becomes what do we do? Most obvious thing to do is what do we do in the stand back? We got the stamp sellers to give up their commissions because otherwise they're going to have the daylight speed out of them. They're going to be charged in feather, have their houses destroyed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let's try that. We could try that. Well, I can tell you that how things come down really is going to vary, except for the universe non acceptance of the demons. Let me turn this to this. We're getting close to the infinite equipment for the Five types of tea are on board seven ships in late September and October of 1773. Five types. We have blue pea, very common tea. In fact, we would call it blue pea. I could say, would you like to go for a pot of blue pea? Very popular, cheap. Congo, Tyson, which is a favorite of Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, John Hancock, John Adams. Singlo Souchon. Five teas. You may try two of those five if you stay at home and join us for a tea tasting. There are on board these seven ships carrying a total of 544,000 pounds of East India green and black teas. Two of those teas I mentioned, green and the three are black teas. Sailing from London to ports in America. One ship is going to New York City, one to Philadelphia, one to Charleston, and four ships heading to Boston. The first to arrive in Boston's harbor was the Darton on November the 20th. You all have heard of the New York Tea Party? You know, the Philadelphia Tea Party. You get the idea. Why Boston? Well, come on, we all know the answer to that. You know, you see the Dr. Jones. You know, so. <laughs> No, that's them. They're crazy. You know, they had to send troops into Boston during the protests of the 1768 County duties. And you probably remember how that was complicated. The call began every year. What good sales of this print made in Boston Massacre? Crazy. That's why we had a Boston Tea Party there. Actually, with all those troops there, over a thousand of them, and the Royal Navy there. Um, I don't know if that sounds like something. But I will say this. One thing you can say about Boston is they enjoyed every little fabric. Yeah. This is before they had any quarantine for that hadn't happened. Anybody know what November 5th is? I thought 
they have parades, bonfires, and have cheese, all kinds of fun stuff, which we have that. This is pretty fun, beautifully for it. But anyway, they called it Pope's Day in Boston, since this was a, an attempted Catholic insurrection over the crown of Parliament back in 1605 uh, by Fox. So, but they still celebrate it in Boston and went crazy every November 5th. So, yeah, we can buy on the same. Yeah, you probably get crap yeah. And then, of course, we got the leaders. Here's Hancock, left, Adams, right. Hancock, the wealthy merchant, the wealthiest man in Boston. Sam Adams, uh, former treasurer of Harvard, who is always in the courts because he screwed things up there and not doing all that good uh, as a tax collector in Boston. His father was a brewer. He was somehow content and, of course, the radical and the best organizers about to man. And we could say them, them, them. But okay, here's the thing. Do you realize when people are going to tea because of the tea you need during the dance in the movies, that the city of any great size that did the worst in the boycott despite all the year with Boston? What are the talks went to these people, as famous as they are? They weren't doing nearly as well as New York, Philly, and Johnson. And so there's a real motive. Of these two, not to be embarrassed. I mean, the sons of liberty are going to make the progress, but I have not been seeing just the city relations. That's the son of the city that can organize and make this uh, Then we have those cheap uh, consignees, yes, who the British East India Company, with their good uh, parliamentary authority, intended to be chief salesmen. Mr. Clark and his sons. The one who would never sign a non invitation for that version of the law. And of course, the sons of the royal governor, Thomas Hutchinson. They were also key consignees. And if you think about that, are they going to be willing to be talked out of selling this tea as the consignees? It is a good involved to them. Not to mention the fact they are. We serve it to the health care. You're not going to be talked in by anybody from giving up their consignation. And that's not going to be true of those will be true in Boston. And the t shirts come, they are going to be acting in all courts in America. I understand the law. You have to go within 48 hours of arrival to the custom house and check in. Custom house in every major city still is. On the port cities, you got to check in, and then the clock starts to beat. From there, you've got 20 days to get it unloaded and to get any necessary duties there. Okay, Boston Tea Park, December 16th. Clock ticking explodes December 17th, 20 days from the arrival of the two ships. Boston has another chance to start that. We have our friendly lobster bags. They've been there since 1768. Here they are five years. The people hate them. And the troops hate being there. Uh, they don't go to the Boston uh, and Oyster House, the Union Oyster House. They don't get go to Red Sox games. They don't get Americans. They don't get hard food from Sam Adams or any of the good stuff that Boston's known for because they've been such a problem with violence between them and their nasty citizens that they're out of an island in Boston Harbor. But there's a thousand of them there. there. You don't think they can call that TV on road with the clock ticking like it is? All of the Royal Navy's there, HMS Somerset. Some of you who read Bulletford's ride on the long term may remember the summons. It's still there at 75, and he's the one that rose beneath its stern. And then there's Thomas Hutchinson, the governor. He was the one in the final ruling that had said yes or no to must the tea be unloaded. Boston is going to demand that the tea not be unloaded. And then not the only city that will make those demands. They will make it very firmly and as late as the day of the tea party. They are sending one of the owners of the ships to Milton, Massachusetts, seven miles from Boston, where the royal government is his state. And we just send it home. This is going to result in disastrous violence. Don't do it. You're going to be pulling the board because his sons were to be constant. He said no. So let's turn things over to us.
as Rich said, the clock is ticking. Um, we're finally getting to the to the day of the Boston Tea Party. By the way, we don't call it the Boston Tea Party until 1826, when one of the men who participated in it passed away, and in his obituary, he stated that he had participated in the Boston Tea Party. Mm -hmm. If you didn't know you participated, this is secret. You were keeping it secret. So um, the fact that it took that long before it was even print is interesting. And then it was 1826 before we call it that. In December of 1773, we call it the destruction of the tea or the incident at Person's Wharf, or what my favorite is, the late transaction of the tea. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so tensions are high as Bostonians and others from miles outside the city gathered on several dates in late November and into mid-December to determine the fate of the cargo's tea on board the ships that are in Boston Harbor. Of the four ships that headed out of London to Boston, one of them went aground at the Cape Cod, the other three made it to the harbor. The Dartmoor, excuse me, the Dartmouth, the Eleanor, and the Beaver. They demanded um, of Governor, the colonists demanded of Governor Hutchison that the cargo be returned to London, but he refused, stubbornly refused. On November the 29th, in the Old South Meeting House, which still stands in Boston, it was the largest indoor meeting space by far in the city. The colonists passed a resolution which threatened the owner of the Dartmouth, Francis Roach, with peril if he allowed his cargo of tea to land in Boston. Roach desperately wanted to unload all of the cargo because his family had a whale oil business and he wanted to load the empty ship with whale oil and ship it back over to England. So he wanted to unload it, but he was kind of stuck here. He delayed asking for clearance to send the Dartmouth back to England until he was finally forced to do so on December 15th, he wrote, I'm obliged and compelled by a body of people assembled at Old South Meeting House at the utmost hazard and peril of my life to demand clearance for the ship Dartmouth to go to sea in her present situation with the tea on board. As Rich mentioned earlier, Roach had to travel to Milton, seven miles from Boston, to meet with Governor Hutchison. He conveniently wasn't in the city of Boston at the time. Um, and he arrived there in the evening. He received, Roach received the answer he knew he was going to get from the governor. No ship is going to leave the harbor without a pass from the governor. Uh, technically, the governor says you can't grant a pass for a ship that has not cleared the customs, the custom house. A cold rain is falling the morning of December 16th as people gather once more at Old South Meeting House. As many as 5,000 people were crammed inside Old South Meeting. An unheated hall. People are excited. People are anxious. Other men are gathering at other locations around the city, all anticipating that the governor, the final authority, would not allow the three ships to return to England with their cargo and unloaded. The Boston area Sons of Liberty, as they are known by this point, are prepared to take action. They want to keep the tea from being unloaded at Griffin's Wharf. Francis Roach finally returns to Old South Meeting around 5.45 in the evening. The meeting house at that point is lit by candles and lanterns, and he goes to deliver his bad news to those who are assembled. Prodigious shouts greeted the news that were reportedly were heard two blocks away. Roach could not move the TV forward nor backward. He could only wait for customs officers to seize it the next day when that 20-day limit expires. Those customs officials who call on British troops currently at Castle William Harbor, if they should chose to do so, to sit them in a loading tea. Within minutes of Roach's return and his, his announcement, some in the meeting house left, probably just spread the news around the city. Within about 15 minutes, 
war groups are reported to be heard as more men are arriving on the scene ready to destroy the two. It was either at this meeting or at a previous meeting that people called out suggestions of what are we going to do with this tea. And one person said, let us take our axes and chisels and split the boxes and throw their contents into the harbor. These men, that's what they have in mind. The meeting ended shortly after one townsman shouted from the gallery, Boston Harbor, a teapot tonight. A well-organized band of at least 150 men made their way to Griffin's Wharf. Many of the skies as Mohawks and others had their faces blackened by coal or have a blanket over their shoulders and head. This is so they will not be recognized. They're doing something that's against the law. They don't want to be recognized. Um, this is something that uh, I've just been reading that um, we see a couple of times before this where they'll disguise themselves as, um, as Mohawks. Um, I don't know if you and I have agreed on this or not, but some of what I've been reading is that American colonists at this time are embracing the image of the Mohawk or the American Indian as truly American, not a British king of Adam. So they embrace that image and want to uh, use it, if you will. Um, of the men who participated, uh, to date we know the names, finally, of 116 of the men. Many went to the graves years later having never talked about it. The moon was a waxing crescent. I now have learned what a waxing crescent is. Anyway. <laughs> um, three nights past the new moon. Uh, contrary to what some of us may have learned in grade school, it's not a bright night with lots of loud, rowdy guys jumping on board ship. They're not loud and rowdy, and it's not really bright. It's um, three nights past the new moon. When I mentioned this to our nephew Joseph, who's a doctoral student in astrophysics, he went to the point to explain to me that the sun and the moon were in a certain position on that day, on that year, which would contribute to it being so dark. And it's funny when I had like another day. It's dark. And what's really interesting, the tide is the lowest of the year. The tide is super low, two or three feet. If that, that each ship was sitting in. The band of men divided into three smaller groups, each boarded one of the three ships, and in less than three hours, 340 chests of tea are broken open and their contents are dumped into the harbor. Each full chest could weigh about 400 pounds. Over 1,000 people stood along the wharf, silently. Why? By the way, I found it interesting. No other items in the cargoes were harmed. That's one thing that these men decided on when they were making their plans. We're not out to get anything else. We only want the tea. They didn't harm anything else, any of the other cargo of the cargo that was there. They didn't harm the ships. I think the only thing that was broken was one lock on one ship. And the man who broke it went the next day to buy a new one to take the captain to replace it. The tea piled up quickly in the harbor, especially because of the low tide. Younger men participating rowed out in boats to help break up the tea so it would, it would eventually float away and sink. And some even the next morning were doing that. 92,616 pounds of tea were thrown overboard in the harbor worth 10,000 pounds sterling. That's $1.5 million today. So yes, this is a serious act that they're like, taking on. Just a, a thought, um, backtrack this uh, slide. On each ship, uh, you'll see five to seven Mohawks. Those are our leaders. You'll see an assigned boatswain. Um, you will see Mark Sharman, who do this for a living, showing the other volunteers, how do you move this stuff up? How do you use those gimmicks? How do you get these things to to the uh, side of the ship? The, uh, 
don't know the ship, and then how do we get it over? And you also see uh, a number of watchmen on the dock keeping their eye out for the British Navy and the British Army. Uh, later we learned that the British Navy couldn't hear this clearly, that they could even almost make it out at Castle William a mile away. Little bits and pieces of noise floating across the harbor. They did not know. I'm not sure why, although we still spent the right way. But in honor of those men who were the ones who went over the team, as he said, we know 116 of them, and there were more. But remember, we're not even beginning to tell until at least 50 years later when we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the American Revolution, and names begin to slowly emerge. So we have a list. Of just a stamp of all of those men, and we'll share them with Nathaniel Barber, merchant and insurer. Samuel Barber, a farmer. Adam Eels, cattle maker. Tom Fermini, a farmer. Stephen Bruce, merchant. Jeremiah Cade, mason. Nicholas Campbell, sailor. Thomas Chase, the stiller. Gilbert Kil Colesworthy, copper. James Foster Condy, bookseller. Samuel Cooper, Cooper's apprentice. John Crane, house carpenter. Joseph Eaton, hatter. Joseph Ages, house carpenter. Benjamin Eads, printer. Nathaniel Fronham, coach maker. John Gannell, carpenter. Thomas Gerrish, man. Samuel Moore, painter. Moses Grant, an upholsterer. George Robert Twelve Hughes, shoemaker. Edward Compton Howe, a roommate. Amos Lincoln, house rights apprentice. Ebenezer McIntosh, a shoemaker and a fireman. John Martin, journeyman distiller. Thompson Maxwell, farmer and teamster. Thomas Melville, merchant's clerk. Francis Moore, favorite. Thomas Moore, operator of a commercial wharf. William Pierce, a farmer. John Peters, mariner and shopkeeper. George Ellsbury, schoolteacher. Lendl Pitts, merchant. Paul Revere, silversmith and engraver. John Russell, mason. Peter Slater, a bookmaker's apprentice. Thomas Spear, blacksmith. Samuel Spray, mason's apprentice. John Spur, carpenter. James Stark, Eliza Story, physician. James Swan, printing house clerk. Thomas Yuri, Dick Jordan. So, one thing to know people came from as far away as Maine and Connecticut to be there that night to do this. I want to share one, one short vignette. We have heard, other than my, my opening remarks about tea equipment and, and uh, our little bit tea we ladies grow, how about, let's hear a little bit more about the ladies. I have a fun story about a lady named Lucy Wheeler. Lucy is the wife of one of the patriots who boarded one of the ships on the evening of December 16th. She knew what he was up to and she was anxiously waiting at home for those three hours while he was gone. When he got home, upon taking off his boots, tea leaves fell from them to the floor. Without missing a beat, she swept up the tea leaves and threw them into the pot. <laughs> <laughs> the other place is that they said to you. Um, if you look at this uh, manifest, you can see a list of ships and tea that are going to Boston, to Philadelphia, Charleston, uh, and to New York. And we wonder did they have a tea party or not? So we're going to give you a whirlwind view of that. Charleston, when the tea arrived, they made the tea consignee 
so nervous about accepting the tea that he refused to sign for it. And some days later, now believe it or not, date wise, we're talking December 3rd. So that's 13 days before the Boston Tea Party, about arriving about the same time as the tea had arrived in Boston. And it was on the 22nd. I don't know if they heard the tea party or not, but all that tea was taken and put in the old exchange at the event uh, down on Bay Street uh, in Charleston. You may have seen that building. It is still there. And that's where they hit it. Um, I can tell you that Charleston got another very small shipment of tea later, and they destroyed it when it arrived. So Charleston is going to have none of it. What was different? The Hudson would not take the tea, unlike Boston. Philadelphia. Here's Philadelphia, and all those things. It's America's biggest city, more than 40,000 people. When the tea was scheduled to arrive there, December 25th, Christmas Day, uh, what the people did is they put watchers along the Delaware coming up from Wilmington and watched as that uh, tea ship arrived. And when it got the closest to the shore, this would be the Jersey Shore. Um, they rode out and told the ship to stop at Gun Point and then rode the captain up to Philadelphia, Captain Samuel Ayers, and they intimidated him into not unloading the tea, whether the constant he would have taken it, we don't know. But at any rate, not unloading the ship returns to England. This is one of those great tea ports. Familiar? Some of you may know this is Princeton University, what's known as the College of New Jersey, where three Presbyterians went to get an education. This is Nassau Hall, it's still there. And this is where students gathered in early January 1774, took all the stores of tea that the college had, and in the front lawn in front of Nassau Hall, they burned it. New York, well, their ship, the Nancy, did not make it directly. They ended up having to go to the West Indies, as I recall, to the Caribbean now. And they had a winter over. So when they finally arrived, it's going to be April 18th, 1774, the year before Paul Rivers arrived. They will come in via Sandy Hook, and there they will be matched, as they had been in Philadelphia. And they will essentially um, suggest that that's 198 chests because a lot of tea um, not be accepted by the consignees. And the consignees, who was both auction and thought, were so afraid of the mob, they decided not to. When actually that pulled up with mob, they thought, and this is what happened in England as well. So once again, this tea is going to be escorted away. That's New York. So, you know, parts of New Hampshire, the capital of New Hampshire, on the coast of New Hampshire. When the tea ship there uh, comes in uh, on the Saskatchewan River, uh, a tea was unloaded by a crowd and put in a bonded warehouse. And to avoid violence, the tea consignee was made to pay the duties on the tea and then pay to have his shipped back. Less he turned in fact, he decided that might be the better way to go up. And to tell you that after July of 74, uh, in September, another ship box arrives, and this time they do what they threaten to do in Saskatchewan. Um, and they escorted the ship out of the Saskatchewan that uh, we arrived at the point. And now it's uh, the capital of Maryland. This is an interesting story. This is Global William, uh, Bertrand Williams, uh, Thomas Williams, and his partners decided to try to smuggle the British East India Company tea in, in boxes that were covered with linen to be sold in Canada. And they were discovered. <laughs> and so the people of Annapolis made the Williams and their business partners sail the ship. This is the ship here. Uh, sail their little ship, a steward, out in the bay and burn it with the tea on board. Cool. There are other examples. Chapter Maryland, Yorktown, Virginia. You can go through the list, but you get the idea. But I thought in our list, uh, 
one other one I wanted to tell you, because I thought that it was so tough. There is a story that in the Old South meeting on the 16th of December, minutes before Mr. Roach returns from the bad news from Governor Hutchinson, that he will not be the money. That they were reading things, sort of like when you see uh, filibuster and they're reading out of the dictionary. They were reading things to keep the crowd busy. And they were reading for the Massachusetts spy, the leader of the uh, organ out of the even more radical town of Richter, Massachusetts. And they read the fact that one of the nearby towns, a little 800 person town in Lexington, Massachusetts, had recently gathered and come up with this collection. This is still in the Penn Hall at Lexington. It's dedicated by President Ulysses Grant in April 1775 on the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the revolution. But we trust that God is the same on the fair requirement. We shall be ready to sacrifice the state and everything here in life, yea, and life itself, in support of common cause. And the citizens signed it. But when I find the links, it's two weeks later. They gathered up all the tea in the town and on Washington Com, that will become very famous a year and a fourth later. They will merge all of the tea. And this quickly spreads is an action. Maybe that's where the Princeton students got the idea. But it is so interesting that it will be the same people. It will be on Washington Green and their militia company. At dawn on the 19th of April, 1975, from the British arrived and the first shots of the American Revolution came out. The Lexington Alarm, in some way, begins right about the same time as the Boston Tea Party. Let me turn the things uh, back. Um, actually, it's not back. I'm going to turn the things back. All right, I have a couple of other things I want to say. I'll say it really good. We've been here a long time. Reactions. In most of New England, people are working. In Virginia, they're horrified. In Halifax, they're horrified. In Savannah, in Charleston, in Yorktown, in Norfolk, in Alexandria, and in Annapolis, in Philadelphia, they're horrified. What do you think is going to happen because of the Boston Tea Party? If you never learned this in physics in eighth grade, for every action, there is an equal and not always opposite reaction. And that's why many people who are not big supporters at the time of the Boston people, whether you were talking here in Latin or you were talking just in the hands outside of Boston. But Parliament decides that Boston needs to be punished. The thing you may have heard of, the thing that they did that starts the American Revolution, even more than what George did back in 1754, is the coercive acts. These acts will, of course, most famously shut down Boston Harbor. Wait a minute, you're talking about the third biggest port in the shut. How do you do that? You send the Royal Navy more than what they had before. And you let no boat, no rowboat, no anything get into Boston. It has to be brought in. Boston is a little peninsula on a 100 foot wide net next to the mainland, and then winds up to be about two square miles, jam packed over 20,000 people. And now, all of a sudden, nothing is going to get into that city. The British don't inspect. Think the Germans in one of their roadblocks during World War II. That's what it will look like on Boston Neck. Second of all, they will close the General Court of Massachusetts. Their assembly is abolished. Their charter is withdrawn that they've had since 1691. All royal officials will be paid by the Crown. And their governor is fired. Thomas Hutchinson, and instead a military general, the commander in chief of British forces in North America at that time, Sir Thomas Gage, General Thomas Gage, will now become the governor of Massachusetts. So you're talking about a total stripping of democracy. And to add insult to any three of the forces I have say, almost simultaneously passed the connection, which says that the West will now be part of the occupied French province of Quebec. The official religion will be Catholicism. There will be no assembly. So if you move to Western Virginia, Ohio, or to Ohio, or Kentucky, where that is all now going to be French. Other way, is under British control by the French in nationality and religion and in style of government. And so when the British occupied 
watch that. Free pass improves and annually free has more added in the coming months. It will be June 1st that this edict will go into full force. Uh, prints will be made of it. Everyone seems to know about it. Here in Virginia, um, the General Assembly has purchased the investment by the Royal Governor, Governor Dunmore, and Governor Dunmore to smooth them. But not they I mean, not meet, they just meet unofficially at the Royal Tavern. There they decide to protest the closing of Boston for the day of anybody remember what it was, June 1st, 1774, one of the more famous events, the day of say it again, fasting and prayer. Fasting and prayer. Robert Tartman was famously made the motion. Anyway, weeks later. At the courthouse grounds in the new county seat of Latin County, Virginia, several thousand people gathered to voice their protest. Our courthouse looked pretty much like most Virginia courthouses. We have several newer buildings around, but the dial light in it looked pretty much like our state from all we know. I've seen one sketch of it in the community. Uh, it's not so much like kind of from courthouses where I have a but at any rate, they gather at sightings, free, enslaved, uh, those who could vote, those who could not, and they drew up what became a very famous document. That's substantial. Here were the Americans with loud cheering their adoption of the loud results, and let me you a part of the Latin result. At a meeting of freeholders, another inhabitants of the county of Latin, the colony of Virginia, and the courthouse of Leesburg. On Wednesday, this 14th of June, 1774, Francis P. S. Lyon and the chair to consider the most effectual method to preserve the rights and liberties of North America and to leave our chair, our brethren in Boston, suffering under the most oppressive and tyrannical act of the British Parliament made in the 14th year of its present that would be blamed, whereby their arteries blocked out, their commerce totally instructed, their property rendered useless. Resolved that we will always cheerfully submit to such prerogatives and his majesty as a right by law to exercise its sovereign authority committees and to no others. Resolved that it is beneath the dignity of free men to submit to any tax not imposed on them in a usual manner by representatives of their own choosing. Resolved that the act of the British Parliament above mentioned is utterly repugnant to the fundamental laws of justice in punishing persons providing in the form of trial, but is a despite nurture of a constitutional power designed to be calculated to enslave a free and loyal people. Resolved that the enforcing the execution of the said act of parliament by a military power must have a necessary tendency to raise a civil war. Fortunately, we'll have a birthday of the settings. Prince William had said it before us. Fair enough, we'll say it after us. Necessary tendency to raise a civil war. And that we will, with our lives and fortunes, assist and support our suffering brethren of Boston in every part of North America that may fall on the immediate end of oppression as a redress of all of our grievances and shall be procured in our common liberties addressed on a permanent foundation. It goes on. But you get the idea. Even us, six months after the Tea Party, have come to the same. I'll close up my part of the commentary today before I go to move our tea next door. Of course, with something more about the ladies. Um, this is in Edenton, North Carolina. Has anybody been to Edenton? Lovely place, it? absolutely beautiful. We made our own liberty teams, and some of us were editors of newspapers, so we could, you know, help call for the days of what Rich was talking about. Um, 
women, women, I think, did, did a lot, and they certainly supported their husbands a lot in the patriotic power. There are women in, here in Edenton who, on October the 25th, 1774, so about 10 months after the Boston Tea Party, they put their names on paper and sent it to King George. Penelope Barker organized 50 of her closest female friends to sign a letter to the king himself. This is a bold move. They're putting their names on paper. Now, the patriots, the, the men who, were, who went on board the ship, yes, very brave, very bold. But these women are putting their names on a piece of paper. They signed their names for a letter protesting the egregious taxation on the colonies by the British government, vowing to boycott British goods. This is uh, making history of the first female political activist in America. This became known as the Edenton Tea Party. You can go there today and um, you can visit the house where Penelope Barker lived. It's now a wonderful visitor center, um, museum, bookshop. No tea room, though. We did find it, but I have rain over for tea. Speaking of tea, I'm going to go next door and get um, water boiling. Uh, for the three teas that we have, any of you who would like to stay after to taste the teas, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have three of them. Um, and you can come on over. But I, uh, I want you to stay long enough, though, if you're a few minutes from Rich about our um, semi quincentennial the uh, committee that we have for commemorating the, the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution. I'm going to take my tea cup. And if you have any questions for me, oh, sure. and, um, you can talk with me afterwards over there. It is traditional here to keep this lecture series going as to have truly equitable fashion to touch into it, uh, whatever uh, builds you happen to not need uh, or your own confidence in what is the most relevant society. So you'll see uh, our, uh, our people are coming around and look for the poll. Uh, and a mask. They know you put in another and to take all your money. And many of you were doing, uh, we decided that we did the years not to charge for this. Uh, I did want to say one thing. Latin County, uh, under the uh, auspices of the state and in the request of the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, is a part of the state's Virginia 250 commemoration effort, which will run from 1773 to 1783, uh, most actively from 73 to 81, in other words, 20, 20 to this past year, uh, when things began on March 12th, uh, until shortly after it may get extended again. The initial idea was that this was going to be a commemoration of the Declaration of Independence. But then that was something of 2021. 2024 looks a lot different. And so our commemoration will be organized uh, in our cities and counties. Uh, as well, it has some things being organized by the state, uh, Virginia 250. Our goal is not only to refresh our memories of the industry, uh, to refresh our memories of what we have locally that was important at that time and beyond and to refresh locally our interest in our own communities. Back in 1976, during the bicentennial American Revolution, one of the things that was done here in Lawrenceville was the creation of the Lawrenceville Museum and Historical Society. There's still a few of them. What will we come up with this time around? It is one of the things we're considering uh, on the program for the Lawrenceville Historical Society that we had a seminar this past year uh, that dealt with uh, the, the difficult issue of slavery in Northern Latin. This year, with the key, the issue might be what's the appropriate commemoration in a divided America of this current time? What could we do? What would be good? What would be a bad? And we have some data for that. It may well be one of the summer lectures, but we'll see and we'll give you a class through our newsletter. Uh, what I'm going to do now is, I guess we've got our or uh, at, at, yeah, I'm taking for just a moment. I know we want to be done. I'm glad it's my first. So, I want to ask the question. I'll try to talk with something uh, that seems like an answer. Yes. You mentioned 
that you had some speculation as to why the British troops didn't intervene on item 16. I'm curious to hear what speculation you might have. What do you think would happen if they arrived? Well, I would say that. You know, it's interesting that as you look at the British troops trying to handle the difficulties, Dr. Regan looks to look what happens in the way that they're closing in Boston. That next year is fascinating, not just in Boston, but in New England and in Spanish politics. It's fascinating. I mean, what do we forming our own new version of a militia called the Barnabas? It's a totally different notion, an independent company. That will begin not under uh, provincial auspices, but to stand up for Americans. Those kinds of things. If you think about it, if you're the British, you're dealing with people doing that kind of stuff. You're going to be terribly careful. You don't want the finger pointed at you uh, if you happen to be the one where all explodes into mayhem. So I think that's, that might be the answer. Yes, as to why the Navy, I mean, I don't know. Probably the same reason. Yes. Oh, is it not possible to grow tea in America? Was it, was that trial at all? Uh, not at the beginning of the time, but growing at uh, on James Island in Charleston, by the supermarket, and we are buying it near growing it, buying it, selling it, and growing it in the area around Taylorville. Some of you may know this. You'll have to ask Grace for the exact name of uh, this new operation, but I'm going to keep from them. Um, and, uh, but at the time, no, this was not seen to be a thing that Americans really could do. It's sort of like Jefferson playing around with the land, usually considered to be a general disaster. Who would know that we could figure out how to do it in the day Yes, companies. Or companies. Yes. Well, you you write a list of the names of occupations who are very prominent in there. It's probably the population of the colony as a whole is what 90, 95% of the farmers. How do they, in the business of the city, or the city, or the city? There were farmers involved, and I cut lots of the names because I didn't want to keep saying farm, farm, farm. farm. Um, and many of them did come in and were a part of this. So that may the proportion you saw that is misleading. Um, but uh, it is surprising um, that if you look at a little town like Lexington, which other than eight tavern keepers, a school teacher, and a couple of blacksmiths, and such as that, it was a farmer, and you know, they're radical as all get at for whatever reason. I mean, there's a reason that they're part of the T for it, there's a reason why they're on Lexington Green doing what they did. They didn't start firing first. There. And uh, I think that, that means that we would see lots of differences. For example, Eastern Mountain will not be quite the same as out here uh, west of the Kentucky Mountains. You're going to see huge numbers of people, relatively speaking, involved either through the militia uh, or through the continental army. And, and we'll have programs on this, but from this area, why? Why more than that? People did not all see this the same. On the other hand, I think the one thing we've thrown out of the window about 50 years ago is the old notion that it was a third supported, a third opposed, and a third didn't care. Probably not. Probably a lot more cared, uh, a lot more so than what I want to say safe. That's that is what normally happens in any of these things. And then there were some who did opposed. Anybody else have one? I don't know how much time. More. Yeah. Yes. Our famous messenger, of course, is one of the best known sons of William in Boston. Uh, was certainly extremely involved in all of this and planning of this. Um, and uh, of course, will be very busy uh, making key uh, deliveries of means of correspondence, information, to care with other colleagues. Not just that line on April 18th, 19th, etc. But he was much more involved in that. So, yes, certainly one of the heroes of that. Absolutely. George, uh, uh, 10 or 12 views, uh, it's a strange name, but anyway, he uh, will be one of the last survivors and will be living in the 1962. There's a book about the shoemaker and the teapot. It's a very good name.
Thanks. 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 Thanks.